Uh, we're in week nine of statistical rethinking, and I know for many of you, like me, this is this week we begin the material that is the whole point of your participation. This is multi-level models. Uh, when I was a graduate student, which was sometime last century, um, multi-level models were this cutting-edge thing, uh, and only if you were some kind of quantitative hotshot in the social sciences would you bother to learn. It was considered showing off uh, to learn and use multi-level models. Uh, that is no longer true, uh, and I'm happy to say. It is now a requisite skill for everybody who gets a PhD in any science to understand multi-level models. And I'm not joking. I'm not saying that to be a hot shot or show off. It's just true. And this has been true in the sense of the scaffolding of, of statistical skills for many generations. Uh, one of my uh, PhD committee members, uh, Nicholas Gordon Jones, who's a behavioral ecologist, um, uh, said that uh, when I, my first year in grad school, he, he counseled me to learn multi-level models because he said, look, when I was in grad school, Richard, uh, multiple regression was fancy. Uh, if you were using oh, multiple predictor variables, that's really showing off. That's, 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 you're, you're a hot shot. What is it? Are correlations not good enough for you? Uh, <laughs> partial correlations. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the generation after his, everybody had to do multiple regression. You're an idiot if you didn't use multiple regression. Um, now, now, of course, the fact is you can be an idiot no matter what statistical method you use, right? It has nothing to do with what statistical method you use. But there are these standards, right? And every generation gets more sophisticated than the last in what, what the default tools are. And that's because the new defaults are incredibly useful in default inferential situations. And once you get trained to use them, you learn them in a way that's simpler than the method of discovery. And that's the way technology, technological evolution tends to, tends to work. So multi-level models are our new default. And uh, they're not substantially more complicated than ordinary multiple regression. But it depends upon having the right set of metaphors and uh, frameworks to think about them in. So let me work on that a bit here to start. Uh, forget about models just for a moment. Uh, this is a, a story that I start chapter 12 with in the book. And in the chapter, I give you all the citations to this. Uh, Clyde Waring is a real person. Uh, he's a musicologist, quite accomplished. He's a, a very successful conductor and music theorist and uh, pianist as well. Um, and uh, at some point in his life, he contracted um, a herpes virus. And as those of you know who know something about the herpes virus, depending upon which tissue it infects in your body, it manifests as a very, very different disease. And so this particular herpes virus was a cold sore. He got it in his head area. And it happened to travel along a nerve into his brain uh, and gave him uh, the worst kind of herpes you can get is the brain infection version. And he suffered a serious and permanent form of brain damage from this. And he lost the ability to form new long-term memories uh, because herpes ate part of his hippocampus. Okay, yes. <laughs> Happy New Year. <laughs> so, right. But uh, I'm telling you this story for a reason. Uh, the interesting thing about this case, now Clyde Waring has been intensely studied by neurologists since because there are a very small number of cases like this where you get a very specific site of damage. Those of you who are psychologists, right, you know you've read lots of books about patients like this. And Clyde Waring's a really interesting case because he remains incredibly cognitively competent for all the memories that were formed before his disease. Uh, he can still play piano, but if you ask him if he can play piano, he has no memory of ever learning it. Uh, and he can't learn new songs, uh, but he can play old songs. Uh, he can still conduct orchestras, which is something he used to do for a living, uh, but he doesn't remember doing it. And as soon as he finishes conducting an orchestra, he will have no memory of having done that. Uh, it's, it's a very strange sort of thing, and uh, a fascinating case. And he keeps these fascinating diaries. I'll show you an excerpt of one on this slide, uh, where every morning when he wakes up, it's like the first time he's ever woken up. Uh, and he has these bizarre notebooks about feeling alive. Like, oh, this is amazing. Uh, it's like, the, you know, the, imagine the first time you ever saw a Star Wars movie, and it's the first time a Death Star ever blew up, right? And then every other movie when another Death Star blows up, right? It, it seems less fresh. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm taking a jab at Star Wars here because it sucks. But, you know, <laughs> inviting hate mail, I know. But, <laughs> but no, it's all the movies are the same, right? There's always a Death Star, and it always blows up. So, <laughs> uh, but for him, it's fresh every time and exciting, right? Because the plot is good the first time. <laughs> and it just gets older after a while. Uh, it's a very fascinating case. Um, so this form of amnesia is called anterograde amnesia. It's the inability to form new long-term memories. 
uh, every cup of coffee, five wearing experiences, is the first exciting cup of coffee it's ever had. Right? Now, unfortunately, your first cup of coffee is usually bad because it's initially the first, but you get used to it after a while. Um, so what I want to argue is that typical multi, uh, multiple regression, uh, what you might call fixed effect regression, so all the models we've done so far in this course, also have interrograde amnesia. They have the inability to form no, new long-term memories uh, when they're considering new clusters within the data. They forget everything they've learned uh, and when they move from one cluster to the next and pretend that none of the other data are relevant. And this is deeply irrational. Uh, you do not want to be an organism that thinks like this, because you'd be like Fibwaric, which is not a good state to be in. Uh, and you don't want to program your little golems to act like this either. Uh, so let me give you an idea of what I mean by cluster. So clusters in the data are things like individuals, ponds, I'll talk about ponds later today, um, roads, classrooms, and uh, obviously students within classrooms are different from one another because there are classroom specific effects, say you're measuring test scores or something. Um, or all the individuals are different from one another, so that there are correlations uh, in all the data from one individual. These individuals have different tendencies. Those are what we call clusters. Nevertheless, when you meet a new individual, after you sampled a bunch of students in the classroom and you're told, here's another student from that same classroom, uh, you have a prior that's been informed by the other individuals you've met. Individuals are not maximally different from one another. You get to use information. Right? So this is like when you visit a, a cafe, the fact that you've been to other cafes in your life gives you expectations, which are largely valid, about what will happen in that cafe, how long you might wait for a cup of coffee. Um, uh, that is uh, remembering things and using information. Uh, fixed effects models do not do this because they have, uh, you can put in unique intercepts, so-called fixed effects, for every cluster, but only the data from that cluster informs that parameter. And that's bad. That's very bad. Because you're ignoring information that would be useful. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll build on this metaphor in a second. Um, Multi-level models are better than this because they remember their past experiences, so to speak, and they use that to make better educated guesses about new clusters. And so they learn faster the true values of every cluster because they pool information among clusters. They have memory, and they form new long-term memories, and they use it to learn, uh, in fact, learn optimally in the small world. Uh, if you think back to chapter, was it two? Was that uh, where it was? Chapter two of the metaphor of large worlds and small worlds, Remember, Bayesian models are optimal conditional on the model in the small world. Now, of course, the model's wrong, <laughs> so you have to be cautious about that. Uh, but this is the way the, the robot learns optimal, given the assumptions. So the, the, the strategy multi-level models use to get this pooling of information is properties of clusters come from some quote-unquote population. These po this population is a statistical population. It just means that uh, it makes sense to use some of your estimate from one cluster when you're making a guess about the next. Uh, and I'll build on this on the next slide. Um, the inference about the population defines the pooling phenomenon that I'll show you pictures of in today's lecture. And so all the previous clusters actually improve your guess about any new cluster. Uh, so you're, often people are asking themselves if they want to use a multi-level model, and there's lots of strange conventions for figuring this out. But I think this, the last line on this slide is the question you want to ask yourself. This is the decisive thing. If when you encounter a, a new cluster, uh, uh, say you've visited a bunch of classrooms and you've got estimates of the average test score in all those, and now you've got some new classroom. Before you see the test scores in that classroom, I ask you to make a guess about the average test score. Uh, if you think that all the other classrooms help you make a guess, then you should use a multi-level model. If you think that none of the other classrooms help you make a guess, then you want to use the fixed effects model. I think in the real world, most of the time, you're in the former situation, not the latter. Because classrooms, they're not all the same, but they're not completely different either. Right? Same with individuals, ponds, roads, other things of that sort. Uh, uh, this, this is uh, uh, an important device because there's all kinds of weird conventions for saying people appeal to aspects of, of the design of the experiment and other things. All that's irrelevant. It's just about information. And it's about whether the other clusters will improve your guess about a new cluster. Okay, so here's, here's the metaphor I want to uh, help you think about this um, uh, and why the statistical population as the pooling is, uh, is sensible uh, and useful for us. Uh, I want you to imagine 
that uh, as, as I do in the beginning of chapter 12, that uh, we've got some robot that we're programming. We want it to learn the, how long it, it, uh, you're expected to wait for a cup of coffee at a cafe. So it's going to visit some cafes. It's like a Roomba. People know what that is, one of those little robots that cleans your floor. So you, you get a Roomba, and you pop it open, and you reprogram it, and you're going to make it visit some cafes, and it's going to order coffee. <laughs> and uh, this is the new world, right? And uh, it's going to record the waiting time. Uh, how should uh, uh, the Roomba optimally use uh, the coffee Roomba, op optimally use the information, the data it collects? Uh, and you can imagine you, you get two of these, for, uh, for the sake of the example. You have two of these Roombas uh, uh, programmed this way. And they visit the same two cafes, but in opposite orders. Uh, so here I've got pictures of a cafe in, in, I think that's Paris. I don't know, I made these slides several years ago. Does that look like Paris on the left? Yeah, yeah it could be Paris. <laughs> it's Europe. <laughs> and uh, um, I mean, it could be Belgium, for all I know. <laughs> and uh, on the right, that's definitely Berlin, because it's a dirty alley. There's a cafe in a dirty alley. That's <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> the locals understand what I'm talking about. I love Berlin, but. Yeah, your cafe might be a dirty alley <laughs> with broken bottles. <laughs> and, uh, so uh, it's going to our robots are going to visit both of these cafes, but they're going to do it in opposite order. So robot one starts in Paris and it orders some coffee here and it gets that data and say it waits seven minutes or something. You know, I mean in Paris you could wait a long time actually to get the attention of the help. And uh, the other robot, robot two, starts in Berlin and orders a coffee, uh, and then they travel crossways and visit one another. So here's the question now. If you were robot one, you've got your estimate, say, seven minutes from the Paris Cafe and you arrive in Berlin. Before you've ordered your coffee, what should your expectation be? Right? Uh, uh, the fact that you waited seven minutes gives you information. Now, you don't expect it to be exactly seven minutes because it's not a lot of data to go on, but it gives you information. Right? And then you order your coffee in the Berlin Alley and you, it takes, you know, it's probably be faster if I can use my stereotypes. <laughs> uh, and then you can do better than the seven-minute guess. You update that seven-minute guess, but you start with a prior that comes from the previous cafe. And that makes sense. It's a very vague prior. It's not that you expect it to be exactly seven minutes, but it's centered on seven minutes with a lot of variance around it. And then you observe, say, three minutes, and you update it. You update that prior. Uh, the other robot has the opposite experience. It started out with its three-minute coffee, and then it goes to Paris, and it expects three minutes, and then it takes seven. Again, it starts with a prior, a vague prior, centered on three, gets to update that, and it goes the other way. But hang on. Uh, information shouldn't depend, your inference shouldn't depend upon the order you experience the data in, right? Uh, these robots need to update the old cafe at, when they get the new data, right? It's, it's so... Robot one travels from Paris to Berlin. When he gets the Berlin coffee, it needs to update its estimate of, of the Paris cafe, too, because the other robots went that direction updated the Paris thing. right? And that's where the statistical population comes in. It's, a, it's the idea you're estimating the average wait time in the population of cafes and the variance among them. And that's through that inference, you get to do the time reversal of the inference here. So that the exact sequence that you visit the cafes in doesn't matter. Uh, you can do the reverse updating. Uh, you'll see how this works when, uh, when I draw it up. But this is the, the sort of rationality constraint. The time sequence can't matter. Right? The, the, your robots would be irrational if the exact sequence they visited the cafes in affected their inferences. You don't want that. And the way to avoid that is to have them estimate the properties of the population of cafes. And then use that as the prior for each cafe. Each cafe can be different, but you're estimating at the same time the properties of the whole population. Um, the variation in the population is going to have a very strong effect on how much, how strong the prior is. That is, how how much pooling is what we're going to call it. You do. Um, that is, you can think about it. How similar will the inferences be to the old fixed effects model? Uh, so, here's an example to help you think about it. Uh, Cafes are a bad example because they're all pretty much alike, actually. I mean, the scatter and how long it takes to get a cup of coffee doesn't vary that much internationally. Right? Having traveled the world a lot and ordered a lot of coffee, I, I attest <laughs> uh, to this experience. Uh, you never end up waiting two hours, right? <laughs> it doesn't vary that much. You never get it immediately. Uh, and unless it's really bad coffee, like us, you do. Uh, so here's another example where the there's a lot of variation, and that means that the prior has a very small effect because it's extremely vague. When you estimate the population, 
it's extremely flat as a distribution. Um, I used to do field work in East Africa, and uh, one of the major challenges uh, I experienced, and I know many of my colleagues did too, uh, living in East Africa is intestinal infections. <laughs> uh, Got to keep yourself healthy. Uh, you're eating a lot of stuff that's not perfectly clean. Uh, and the solution I found was to constantly spike my food with spice. Uh, constantly. Just my mouth was always on fire, but I was healthy. And uh, so I always had a pocket full of these peppers, what we call goat peppers. Uh, and um, they grow all over the place. Every, every household's got them. I always had a pocket full of them. And I would, you know, put a half of these in whatever I was eating, and that kept me healthy because capsaicin, the chemical that makes these things spicy, is, is strong, very, very strongly antibacterial and antiviral. Uh, it's a really, really good medicine. Um, the thing about these uh, goat peppers, though, is that peppers from the same plant can have radically different spiciness. Uh, they're not perfectly domesticated, is the way I would, I would explain it. And so uh, I would be very careful about testing a particular pepper to figure out how much I would put into my food, because one pepper could be very low on spice, and I have to put the whole thing in there, and another would kill me, uh, right? Just drive me into, into fits of tears. Uh, so the variation among peppers, there's a population of peppers is the point, and when you pick up a new pepper and you're trying to guess how spicy it's going to be, the population does give you some expectation, but it doesn't tell you too much about this exact pepper, right? Uh, and the multi-level model accommodates this by learning the variation as you visit the clusters. As you sample the peppers, it's estimating the variation among peppers, and that, that tunes the prior. So multi-level models work by estimating the prior. This is the first set of models where the prior distribution will be learned from the data, and that's what's multi-level about them. Uh, in effect, there's two likelihood functions, um, but one of them is called prior. Uh, so I, I had argued that multi-level models are the new default, and um, defaults are powerful things. And I want to help you remember this by giving you an example of that. Uh, some of you know um, these data already about organ donation, which there's a lot of variation in Europe about it. The public of basically uh, every country that's ever been polled is largely, a majority is in support of organ donation. Uh, there's international shortages of, of replacement organs. And given the uh, support, the uh, public support for it, there shouldn't be. There's a mismatch between the uh, enunciated support and the actual supply. And that's because uh, in many countries, it's an opt-in system. You have to do something to check a mark to say that when you die, your organs can be donated. Uh, and in opt-in countries, the supply is vastly smaller than the actual support for it. Many people say that they would like their organs donated upon their death, but they never go about checking the box. Uh, in other countries, it's an opt-out policy. And then there's not a shortage. And so I show you the data here. Uh, we have opt-in countries on the left, uh, including Germany. Uh, and Germany, I mean, public support for organ donation is over 50%. It's, it's, it's quite high. And in the book, I give you a citation to the, to the polling data. And then the opt-in country, the opt-out countries you see, uh, it's almost completely high, except for Sweden, which is in the case lots of people opt out uh, in Sweden. I don't know what the sociology of that is. Anyway, the point is, um, defaults are very powerful things, and so it's important to establish statistical defaults um, that do good things for our inference. But it's perfectly fine to opt out. There are times when a multi-level model is totally unnecessary, uh, and that's fine. There's no shame in not using one. It's just that it's a default. It, it makes sense to ask people to excuse not using one than to ask them to excuse using one, because they are inferentially better. If there are clusters, they are inferentially better than models uh, that don't use pooling. Uh, <coughs> okay, this is just what I said. Sorry. So, all right, here's what we want to do today and on Friday. I'm going to introduce multi level models uh, with a slow example. Uh, the whole goal is to explain to you these mystical things called shrinkage and pooling uh, that arise from the robot and the way it forms a prior about the population. Now, these are statistical properties, and I'll show you what they look like visually. Um, we want shrinkage and pooling of our estimates because it makes the estimates better. Uh, and it does so for reasons you've already learned, because it trades off overfitting. Uh, it, they overfit less because uh, they use the whole sample rather than just isolated pieces of the sample. I'm going to show you how to fit these models from back to stand. Uh, they look very much like the models you've already fit. Except now the prior will have parameters inside of it rather than just fixed numbers. That's it. That's all you do. 
since you replace your fixed numbers with parameters inside the prior, you get a multi-level model. That's really basically all there is to it. And uh, I'll show you some methods of plotting and comparing these models. And then uh, probably next week, I don't think we'll get to this on Friday, uh, this pooling strategy extends, it isn't just discrete clusters that you can do this with. You can do it with lots of structured variables, ordered, vari ordered categorical variables or perfectly continuous variables like age can also be pooled. There's a device called a Gaussian process, which is the worst name ever, right? Two vague terms, Gaussian er, process. <laughs> so there's no hint about what this means. Um, it's a, a, a way to extend shrinkage and pooling to continuous categories like age. And uh, what that means is uh, ages that are similar to one another, you expect them to be more similar in the things that happen to them, right? So there's pooling, but it's local, and it fades as you move away from any particular point. Uh, so this is a, a common thing, for example, in some areas of political science. Uh, individuals in birth cohorts tend to vote in similar ways because of historical things that happen around the time they turn 18. And... Um, uh, I can tell you about it. I'm, I'm, I'm the Reagan kid generation from the United States, and, and yeah, we're bad. We're very bad for politics. Someone's not here. <laughs> and, uh, no, we're not all bad. We're wonderful people. We are. But we're politically different than uh, other groups. You know, we came of age when, you know, we were winning the Cold War and stuff like that, and we got kind of drunk on it. And <laughs> stuff happened. Anyway, to make fun of my own generation. But just to say that there are cohort effects, and those cohort effects are persistent. They're lifelong effects. And... Uh, but they fade as you move away from any particular historical event. So there are categories in this, and you want to do pooling uh, to deal with those random effects, as it were, of age groups. Um, but they, those effects bleed out into neighboring ages, so the, the categories aren't discrete. The Gaussian processes let you do that. Uh, they let you do pooling on continuous categories where there's similarity. Uh, another way to think about it is distance. Uh, there are points in the landscape emitting things like toxins, uh, and so proximity to those emission points affects the outcomes in areas, but it's a continuous process, and you want to measure covariance across space. Gaussian processes model things like that as well. But it's just an extension of this pooling strategy you're going to learn today. Okay, that's a lot of promises. Um, let's ground this in some examples. When do we use multi-level models? We use it when there's some clustering in the data. Clusters are things like classrooms. Uh, you can have classrooms and you can have schools. There's students in classrooms and schools. This is the classic example. Um, in education, people use multi-level models quite a lot, uh, owing to a, a certain British tradition. Uh, uh, so classrooms within schools are a type of cluster. Students within classrooms are another type of cluster. Grades within students are yet another type of cluster. So this is like Russian dolls, right? You have clusters within clusters within clusters. And you can do pooling on all these at the same time inside a multi-level model. Um, and then, of course, questions within exams even. They're clustering on that. Right? Anytime you've got repeat observations on the same entity, you've got clustering. Uh, and if you use a multi-level model, you can make stronger inferences, better inferences, uh, about the tendencies of each cluster. <coughs> we worry about this uh, uh, most intensely when there's what we call imbalance in sampling, so that some students or schools uh, are sampled more than others. Those of you who do field work, this is always true in field data. Right, so primatologists, uh, <laughs> uh, this is the norm. If you do any kind of behavioral ecology, whether it's on humans or other primates, uh, you get massively imbalanced samples because some individuals end up in your data way more than others. They just act a lot. <laughs> right? uh, or you accidentally sample them more. Multi-level models let you deal with that. They don't bias your inference based upon just the frequency with which a particular cluster appears in the data. So in behavioral ecology, that's the usual reason we appeal to these, because we have massively imbalanced data. Those of you who do laboratory experiments, congratulations, uh, you usually don't have imbalance, right? But you will still get better estimates, even in the absence of imbalance, uh, because you'll have pooling between the clusters, right? It's just a particular inferential threat when there's imbalance. Uh, we had examples earlier in the course where we could have used pooling. We had individuals and families in the, in the home data, uh, species within clades when we talked about primate milk uh, earlier on. Uh, nations and continents, when I talked about ruggedness and the economy, uh, and applicants and departments very recently. We talked about uh, uh, binomial models. Uh, so the example I want to work with today is a new data set uh, where I can show you the pooling. Uh, this is in the rethinking package. It's read frog data. This is a field experiment. Uh, these data are numbers. The outcome variable is numbers of surviving tadpoles of uh, read frogs. Uh, 
which were grown in buckets, but they were in the wild. So reed frogs lay their eggs on leaves, and what the field experimenters did, if I remember the experiment right, I hope, you can look it up and embarrass me if, if not, uh, so they hung the buckets under the leaves. So the eggs hatch and the tadpoles are supposed to fall into the water, but then they fell instead into a bucket. Right, that's life. And, uh, and uh, uh, the experiment is set up so that there would be different densities, different numbers of eggs on the leaves that could fall in. And some of these buckets were spiked with predators, or rather I think they were shielded or not, so the predators could or couldn't get into them, I, if, I think is the manipulation. What are the predators here? Well, the things like the thing on the right-hand side. You get dams, I think that's a damselfly larva. There's also a dragonfly larva. Um, dragonfly and damselflies spend substantial portions of their lives as aquatic larva, and they eat a lot of tadpoles. Uh, and it's just, you know, nature. Not in Disney movies, you don't see things like this in Disney movies, but <laughs> this is how it goes. Um, so uh, this is a, a field ecology experiment that gives us a lot of information about anti-predator strategy. So tadpoles can mob predators and do other things to defend themselves. And that's what the experiment was actually about, is figuring out behavioral strategies and density-dependent effects and how these things trade off. Um, we're not going to go deep into the analysis of all of the treatment effects uh, in this today. I just want to show you when we leave out treatment effects, how we can use a multi-level model to analyze variation and do pooling. Now, what is the pooling? Well, they're different so-called ponds. These are the buckets <laughs> that, uh, that tadpoles are in. So we're going to be interested in how the number uh, uh, of surviving tadpoles varies um, across buckets. <coughs> I guess here I call them tanks. Yeah, they were buckets. I remember seeing a, a photo of this. Um, so we have tadpoles in tanks, different densities. The outcome here is the number surviving. This is a binomial model, like the uh, UC Berkeley admissions data. Right? It's like, think about each tadpole as being an application. And whether it lives or not is whether it's accepted. Yeah, but the model structure is the same, basically. And now instead of departments, we have tanks. Yeah. So some tanks have more applications. <laughs> and uh, then they have acceptance rates. And we want to we want to model the variation and get estimates, uh, the best estimates we can of the survival probability in each tank. And we're going to use a multi-level model to do this. Um, first, let me show you the fixed effect version of this model without the pooling so you can get the structure in place. What this means is, uh, this is model one here. There's going to be a dummy variable for each tank. So we get a unique intercept for each tank. And we only use the data from each tank to estimate that. Parameter. Uh, this is like models you've done before. And then we're going to turn to the multi-level model and we'll use what are called varying intercepts by tank instead. So here's the fixed effects model. Number surviving in tank I is SI uh, on the left there. Uh, this is binomially distributed variable uh, according to the maximum entropy considerations. And uh, N of sub I is the initial density, the number of tadpoles that hatch into this tank. And P sub I will be the probability any particular tadpole survives. We model this as a logit um, with an intercept on the log odds scale. This is alpha sub tank, right, where tank is a number from one to the number of tanks. I think there are 48 tanks in these data. <coughs> so there's alpha sub 1 through 48. We are going to regularize. We have a fixed prior for alpha tank, normal 0, 5. If you remember log odds scale, this is a prior centered at 0. 0 on the log odds scale is 50%. Yeah, remember this? And this was last year, I think, so I, I forgive you if you forget. And five is like the whole space. <laughs> That's like the whole log on space. This is a very uninformed prior. But it makes infinity impossible, which is extremely important. Right? Uh, you don't, infinity is not possible. Um, but it's a fixed prior. Uh, and all of these parameters are independent of one another. Here's the code to fit it. You guys are pros at this now, right? It looks basically the same. Yeah, here's your alpha tank. You just do this bracket tank. And then it figures out there are 48 of those. It makes a vector of 48 parameters. It estimates them. Um, we're not going to look at those estimates yet. We'll plot them up later. Let's fit the uh, multi-level model, model now. Now we're going to do the... Uh, there's So the previous model has regularization in it. That normal 0, 5 prior on the intercepts has been to regularize inference, to reduce overfitting, just like all the other weakly regularizing priors I've introduced in the course. But it's not adapted because the prior is not learned from the sample. It's fixed. It's deus ex machina. You just like stick it into the model, right? And hope it's a good guess. Uh, Multi-level model instead is going to have an adaptive prior that is learned from the data, and that means it has parameters inside of it. So here's the adaptively regularizing model. 
Now the alpha tank parameters are varying intercepts. Uh, the varying uh, just cues you, it's not good terminology, but it cues you to the fact that there's an adaptive prior attached. So notice now the model looks very similar, but now this normal distribution isn't 0, 5, it's alpha, sigma, which are two new symbols. And we, those are parameters, three parameters, and we're going to have to learn them. And then they get their own priors uh, just below. Uh, alpha has a normal 0, 1. And what is alpha? It's the average across tanks, the average survival rate across tanks. Yeah? And what is sigma? Well, it's the variation on the log odd scale across tanks. Well, the standard deviation uh, on the log odd scale across tanks. So normal alpha sigma is the distribution of tank survival probabilities on the log odd scale. Yeah? You with me? Okay. <clears throat> A little bit about terminology. Um, these things are, are often called varying intercepts. That's the terminology I tend to favor. They're also called random intercepts. Uh, uh, these terms can mean different things uh, depending upon speaker and context. It's really awful. It's a terrible thing about statistics. Uh, it makes me think statistics, applied statistics needs a total reset just to cleanse the vocabulary. But uh, it's normal if you're confused by this. Sometimes people will use random intercepts to mean something completely different, uh, like the sort of thing that, that happens in certain kinds of ANOVA. And, but it's, it's not statistically the same necessarily. Um, Neither of these terms makes a lot of sense in terms of what it actually denotes. What does random mean? Uh, if, if you've been paying attention uh, uh, in, in this course, uh, you've figured out that I've tried to convince you that all random ever means is we don't know something, right? Uh, random is an epistemological state uh, because the universe is deterministic, right? That's sort of like pre-commitment to doing science. <laughs> so you think the universe is deterministic. And Random just means we don't know something that would let us predict the outcome, and so we average over the stuff we don't know, and that's what creates distributions. So you can, this is true of every random number generator example we've ever had in this course, even the soccer field thing where I first generated uh, Gaussian distribution. If you knew everything about the physics of the coin flips, you could exactly predict the distribution of step lengths on that soccer field, right? Because coin flips are deterministic. Everything about the physics of coin flips is deterministic. That's known. It's just that it's a chaotic system, so that it's incredibly sensitive to initial conditions. That's why you can't predict coin flips. It's because you can't measure them precisely enough. But the physics are deterministic. There's nothing inherently random about coin flips. It's a property of us that they're random. We use them as a device to randomize because none of the observers can guess whether heads or tails will turn up if you flip it right and catch it. If you let it hit the table, it's not random anymore. Some of you know this, right? There might be a massive eagle on one side of the coin, for example that will bias <laughs> which side falls down, right? It's true, those, those uh, eagle coins are biased because the eagle is heavy. And, uh, but if you catch it, it's fair. Uh, and that's because you can't predict it because of the chaotic nature of the, of the physics. But it's not inherently random. It's just our, it's a property of us that makes it random. Does that make sense? Uh, so the word random here isn't doing any work, uh, right? Because everything about this model is random from that perspective. There's tons of stuff we don't know, and that's why we use distributions we, to model our ignorance. But if we could perfectly measure everything, we wouldn't need distributions. That's, that's the gambit of this. Yeah, but think of part of that. You're welcome. You can think about that all day. But, um, and that's fine. Uh, uh, but it, doesn't, it does, means that the word isn't doing any work here, because every, every parameter is random. Every data point is random it's, it's, uh, until, until we know it, until we've measured it precisely. <coughs> Ordinary dummy variables also uh, varying isn't much help because ordinary dummy variables also vary across clusters. In the model I just showed you uh, uh, before, where there wasn't an adaptive prior, uh, the whole point of that model is that you want a unique intercept for each tank. Obviously, the intercepts vary. So why are they very suddenly called varying now? And the answer is there's no good reason for this. This is just invention. And instead of inventing new words, I've just used the old ones, and then I give you speeches like this. Right? So I hope you appreciate it. <laughs> uh, uh, it's, just, it's just awful. I give you a citation in the book to a great paper by Andrew Gelman on analysis of variance. And in the second half of that paper, he's got a, a list that fills almost half a page of all the different definitions of random effects. And they're all incompatible with one another. Uh, but they're all used in the statistical literature. So you're welcome. <laughs> this is just how it goes. It's not your fault if you're confused. It means you're paying attention. And uh, so. Uh, What's distinctive about so-called varying intercepts or random intercepts is that they learn from one another. 
the, that they have memory corresponding to the, they have pooling, they exhibit pooling. So uh, if, if I could rewind time, I'd do lots of things. Uh, but uh, one of the things I'd do is I'd erase this, and maybe we call them nestic from the Greek for memory. These are nestic intercepts because they remember what they've learned from other, uh, 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 other clusters. I know that's never going to catch on, <laughs> right? <laughs> and uh, what's that line from uh, Bad Girls or something? Stop trying to make something happen. Anybody know this? No. Yes, yeah, someone, someone's nodding. Okay, someone knows my joke. That's enough. One, one person is enough to validate me. All right. <laughs> so, uh, so how does this work, these, these nestic intercepts? Um, uh, here are varying intercepts, uh, alpha sub tank, alpha is the mean, sigma is the standard deviation, um, as I said before, and we get those their priors, and as a consequence of this, the survival across tanks now has a distribution, <coughs> and that distribution serves as the prior for each tank, but simultaneously the model is learning the prior. It's doing it all at the same time. You get an adaptive prior that uh, informs the estimate for each tank. It constrains, it regularizes the inference for each tank. Because in a population where tanks don't vary much, if you get a, this is what I'm going to show you in a bit, if you get a tank that's a real outlier, it's probably an accident. Right? And you want to regularize that outlier back towards the mean. But if instead the tanks vary a lot from one another and you get an extreme tank, well then it's plausible. Right? Uh, there's a, a famous example in this literature from American baseball. Uh, uh, which is, I know, not the most popular sport on this continent, but it's uh, about batting average, where uh, most players in, the, in professional baseball are about the same on batting average, but there are some famous historical cases of individuals who are really strong outliers. And the question is, uh, should, is that a fluke? And how many seasons does it take uh, to prove that it's a fluke? And this is a, there's a lot of money writing on this because you've got to recruit individuals to teams when you don't have a lot of data on them. Right, so you use multi-level models to do that business. This is called Moneyball. If you know what Moneyball is, uh, this is about Moneyball. Use basing and multi-level models to do Moneyball. Um, okay. <clears throat> so this is what the model looks like in Map to Stand. Uh, it's the same as before, but now we put parameters inside uh, the prior for the tank intercepts, and then we put priors for the new symbols for A and Sigma uh, just below them. You're going to have to run this in map to stand. It won't work in map. Um, uh, but uh, the formula is very fam familiar uh, to you at this point. So both these models, uh, and by the way, you really need to do this at home. Run them yourself. It, it brings it home. It embodies the knowledge to you. You run the Markov chain on your own warm laptop. Uh, it's very important to do. Um, and then you can look at all the estimates and play around with it. Uh, get scary warning messages. All the things that, that, that make this feel right. Uh, but skipping all those steps, let's just do the comparison, the WAIC comparison between these two models. And I want to talk about the effective numbers of parameters estimate for a second. Uh, so to remind you about WAIC, uh, it's uh, an estimate of the out-of-sample uh, performance of models on relative scale. Right? It's not an absolute measure, so relative to uh, one model relative to the other. Smaller numbers are better because it's a measure of badness, right? Big numbers are bad, are better, worse, right? Worse. Big numbers are worse. <laughs> Sorry, I have an eight-year-old, and so <laughs> you know my English is decaying. Uh, and so, um, uh, and and this PWIC is the so-called penalty term. It's an estimate comes from the flexibility of the model uh, that's. We often call it the effective number of parameters. Uh, and it's a measure. Big numbers here mean that the model has potential to fit more the data more flexibly. Uh, and that's bad in, a, in some sense because remember, there's a trade-off. So you don't want this to be zero because then, then you underfit. But you don't want it to be infinity either because then you maximally overfit. Right? So uh, uh, with these Bayesian models, this number is typically always lower than the actual number of parameters in the model. Not always. Uh, but typically lower. Why? Because we're using regularizing priors. So the parameter count in a model is not a pure measure of the flexibility of the model because we use priors to constrain the parameters. They're not free. And that's good. That's, that reduces uh, uh, the overfitting. Um, but you'll notice that in the... So there are um, 
model 12.1 is the model with the, the fixed effect model that has no pooling in it. It has how many parameters? It has 48 parameters. Uh, the estimate of its flexibility is actually slightly higher here, <laughs> uh, which has to do with features of the data, because uh, the, the flexibility is dependent upon the sample, too, uh, in this case. Uh, but it's about the same. This is close enough for government work, right? <laughs> and 49 is about 48. Uh, it's a little bit higher, but nothing to get too excited about. Um, uh, this happens, by the way, because there are a few tanks that had, uh, where almost all the tadpoles died. And then you're on the edge of a low jit space, and you can't tell what the parameter value is, right? It could be infinitely low. And the only thing constraining it is the prior. And so you get a lot of flexibility for those cases, and that's why you can get uh, cases like this where the estimated number of parameters is actually greater than the literal number of parameters. The actual data matter in, in these estimates of the flexibility. Um, the point to really focus on, though, is that we added... To get the multi-level model, we add two parameters. We go from 48 parameters to 50, but we end up with radically fewer effective degrees of freedom. Uh, it's now 38 instead of 49. How can that be true? This is a weird case. We added parameters, but the model overfits less now. This violates everything you learn in basic statistics, right? That's because in basic statistics, they don't teach base. Uh, <laughs> but that's all. There's nothing weird about this at all. The, the flexibility of a model, the overfitting risk, is a complex feature of the relationships among the parameters. And in classical models, where all the parameters are on a, on a single level, uh, then that's, and there are no priors, then it's true. If you, every time you add a parameter, the fit to the data gets better. But that's no, and that was true back in chapter six, when I first introduced that terror to you, tried to terrify you about overfitting. You should be terrified, by the way. Uh, but uh, it is no longer true. With multi-level models, you can add parameters and get a worse fit to the data but better predictions out of sample. That is the whole point of multi-level models, is we add parameters, we make the model more complicated. It fits the data worse <laughs> because it's using, why does it fit the data worse? Uh, because now the estimate for each tank, I'm gonna show you this on a slide in a second, the estimate for each tank is pooled to be more similar to the population of tanks. So it fits the data from that particular tank worse. It makes worse predictions in sample as a consequence. This is exactly like when I introduced priors to you, in regularizing priors to you in chapter six, as we make the prior stronger and stronger, it fits the sample worse and worse, but the predictions out of sample got better and better. You remember that slide? It's exactly what happens here. That's the whole point. But now the prior is doing the same thing here, but now we're learning it from the data uh, in a multi-level way. That's what's awesome about these, to use a technical term, awesome, uh, about these models. Uh, now, no guarantees, of course. If the model is badly structured, or you have the there's all the usual threats to causal inference that should keep you up at night. Uh, that, that holds too. But this is doing better than a model that doesn't do pooling. Okay, so here's what the estimates actually look like. That that pooling phenomenon I've tried to explain to you only with words. <coughs> what I'm showing you here are uh, all the 48 tanks uh, from the read frog data. On the horizontal axis, we have the tanks index number. 48 tanks numbered 1 to 48. And they're in three groups by the initial densities. There were small tanks, medium tanks, and large tanks that vary in the number of tadpoles initially in them. Sorry, I forget how many that is, but I think it's like 10, 20, 40, or something like that. That's in the data set, though. When you run this yourself, you can take a look. Um, and uh, on the vertical axis, we have the proportion that survived. So I've taken the counts and I've converted them to the proportion so that we can view all the tanks on the same scatter plot. You with me so far? Now the points uh, in there, there are dark filled points and open points. Uh, the filled points you can think of as the raw data, or these are the fixed effect estimates. These are the estimates that come out of the first model we fit, model 12.1, the model that doesn't do any pooling. Uh, there's um, uh, with, a, with a sufficiently flat prior that there's no regularization towards the mean going on here. Uh, so these, you can think of these as if you took just the data from each tank and calculated a raw proportion surviving, that's the dark dot for each tank. You with me? Uh, and then the open points are the multi-level estimates for each tank. The dashed horizontal line on this slide is alpha. It's the estimated average survival probability across tanks, which is quite high. Good news for tadpoles. Uh, a lot of them survived in this experiment, probably because buckets are safer than real ponds, right? <laughs> That's why. 
But regardless of that, what I want you to see now is, um, uh, actually, I think the, sorry, my slide, I'm forgetting. Yeah, uh, uh, the raw mean that I've drawn up here now is different from the population mean. So if we just took uh, who will all the tadpoles together across the buckets, imagine emptying all the buckets into a common giant pond and then just counting up what's the proportion survival in the whole population of tadpoles, it's different than the dashed horizontal line. And the reason is because there's variation among the tanks and some are bigger than others, right? There's imbalance in the data set because of the experimental design. There are more tadpoles in the big tanks. Mm -hmm. But if you're trying to estimate the average survival across tanks, you don't want to let those tanks bias the experiment, right? This is easy to think about if you imagine you did the experiment where there was one bucket with a million tadpoles in it, and then you pooled the data, right? All your inference would come from that one bucket. Yeah, you, that's bad. <laughs> so multi-level models uh, fix that problem for you. So the raw mean there is not uh, the best estimate of the average survival across tanks. That is the dash line, which is that parameter alpha from the model. Um, so let me walk through the different categories now and show you the pooling phenomenon. So let's start with the small tanks. Uh, what I want you to see is that all of the open circles are displaced from uh, the open circles towards the dashed line. Right? So for the tanks where the, where the filled circle is above the dashed line, then the open circle is closer. It's below. And then for the, it's reverse when you're below uh, the dashed line. Yeah? You with me? This is what we call shrinkage. Uh, all of the estimates are shrunk towards the mean. It's like you just shrink everything, right? Uh, but it's not uniform shrinkage. Um, the distance that the points are displaced from the raw estimate is proportional to how far the raw estimate is from the mean. So for the tanks that were really extreme relative to the mean, the estimates move more because the model's more skeptical of that. It thinks that the sampling variation is what created that because that's a very unlikely kind of bucket. Right. Very few buckets are like that, have these really extreme perfect survival rates. You'll notice that up there, there are three tanks, three small tanks where every tadpole lives. Yay. Uh, but is the best estimate of survival in those tanks 100%? If you could have a, a multiverse experiment where you replicated those exact buckets again, right, it could turn out differently? It wouldn't because it's deterministic, but, you know, bear with me. <laughs> Same conditions, right? Uh, there's micro conditions that would vary that are important to us. Uh, you wouldn't expect them all to survive again. It's a fluke. Most, there's some mortality possibility in those tanks. Right? Um, and then for the, uh, likewise on the other end, for the small tanks where um, more than half of the tadpoles die, that's also a fairly unlikely outcome. So those get shrunk up now. Those buckets probably aren't that bad on average. Does that make sense? Uh, middle tanks are, are <coughs> just the intermediate uh, between small and large, so I'll just jump to the large. Uh, to, to get the whole lesson in. Um, we see the same shrinkage phenomenon, right? Uh, uh, now, one of the things that's happening, though, is that there's a lot less shrinkage. Notice that the open points are all closer to the raw estimates for every bucket. Why? Because there's more data per bucket. I think there's four times as many tadpoles in the large tanks as there is the small tanks. And so the data from each tank has a more weight on the inference from each tank. And again, you can do thought experiments to think about the rationality of this. Imagine a tank with one tadpole in it, right? And so now, uh, most of your inference about that tank will come from the population, not from the one tadpole, right? So your best estimate of the mortality in that bucket isn't from the one tadpole's life history, but it's from the population of tanks. In contrast, if you think about our bucket game with a million tadpoles in it, uh, the pooling has no effect on your estimate for that bucket, because you've got so many tadpoles in that bucket, you know what the mortality rate is in that bucket. Does that make sense? And the model handles this. Uh, it, it, this is the, the wonderful thing about Bayes is you don't have to intuit that you need that. You set up the assumptions, and then logic gives you the right answer. That's the great thing about Bayes is you don't have to be clever. You just have to set up the assumptions. You don't have to intuit what the consequences of the assumptions are. That's the point of Bayesian inference. It's, it is the motor that figures out the implications of your assumptions. You just make the assumptions. Now, if the implications of the assumptions are insane, that tells you that something's wrong with your assumptions. That's also a nice bonus, right? You don't have to dutifully obey the consequences. You can say, oh, wow, I set up the model badly. I can tell that because the conclusions are clearly crazy. Right? That happens to me every day. So 
it's, it's a, another feature of this. This is what we use for logic, um, or why we use logic. And, and I've, I've said this before earlier in the course, but then I've lapsed in this sermon. Uh, uh, Bayesian inference is an extension of ordinary true-false logic, of truth tables. And it's an extension to continuous plausibilities. And you want to use it the same way. It's a garbage-in, garbage-out phenomenon. If you make bad assumptions, you get bad inferences. Uh, but that's often a way to learn. You learn about the consequences of your assumptions by these things. Uh, but you don't have to obey them, right? It's a goal. Okay. So we're actually on schedule. This is exactly what I hope to get to. Um, so a point of warning. There are many points of warning about multi-level models and their interpretation. In my experience, one of the most important is uh, the alpha parameter in this model the, the average survival rate across tanks. Uh, it's not the same as uh, the alpha in a model that has no clustering. It's a different parameter. Don't be fooled by the fact that it has the same name. The names is just something you give to it. The machine doesn't care. It has a different meaning. It's now the average of a population. And so here's the typical phenomenon. Imagine uh, uh, you fit a model that has ignores the clusters entirely, and you just estimate the, the you, it's like the model where you pour all the tadpoles into a single bucket, and then you estimate the average rate of survival on the log-odd scale. You get an alpha, and you'll estimate it incredibly precisely. And so if we do that in this case, we get, as shown on the bottom here, this very peaked uh, distribution. And that's just the average survival probability across all the tanks, treating them all the same, as if they were identical. Uh, in the multi-level model, we also have a parameter called alpha, but now it means something different. Now it's the pooling estimator, right? It's, there's this statistical population of tanks that we're estimating the mean from. It's a different question, right? The question in the first model is, if we assume all the buckets are identical in their probabilities of survival, what's the average? You treat them the same. In the second one, we're saying tanks vary. Uh, in the population of varying tanks, what's the typical tank life? And the consequence of asking the different question is there's a lot more uncertainty about it. So the posterior distribution for alpha and the varying intercept model is very vague. And this is incredibly normal. Well, this is the usual outcome. If you, you start with a model that has no varying effects in it at all, no varying intercepts, and you fit that, and then you put in varying intercepts, uh, there'll be these parameters that have the same name. You think of them as the average effect. But they mean different things. And in the multi-level model, it's much vaguer. And errors and inference arise from this because suddenly people will say, if this was a slope, which we'll do uh, uh, starting on Friday and next week, people will suddenly say, well, now it's not significant uh, because the average effect crosses zero suddenly. Now, you should never make that inference anyway. Uh, but it's just not true. Um, why is this vaguer? And the reason, the reason this is vaguer is because now there are many combinations of the specific varying intercept estimates and alpha and sigma that give you the same predictions. And so when you look at the marginal posterior for any one of those parameters, there's a lot of uncertainty about it. But the combinations of them, the sums, are actually determined with the same precision as in the original model. Uh, this is this problem again with the tide prediction engine. right? The predictions are what you want to look at, not at the gears. Yeah? I'll, I'll never get tired of that metaphor. No apology. Uh, but it's this thing, parameters will mislead you. You need to look at the posterior predictions of your model to understand what it actually thinks. Okay. Sorry, I know that's, that's like my 300th sermon uh, on these things. Um, okay, let me sum up now in the last few minutes here uh, the phenomena that we've been talking about and the names that they go by. What we've been talking about, is, shrinkage is this phenomenon of the migration, if you will, of the multi-level estimates towards uh, the estimated population mean. Uh, the further the raw estimate is, uh, the tendency of that cluster from the estimated mean, the more shrinkage you get, because it's less plausible according to the distributional assumptions you've made. Um, if the, the fewer data you have in any particular cluster, the more shrinkage you get, because now the population has more information that's relevant than the cluster does. Uh, the more uh, data you have in a particular cluster, the, the more and more the population gets effectively ignored. Uh, but it works just like all Bayesian inference, right? You're starting with a prior, and then you're updating it. The more data you have for that particular case, the more you update the prior. And eventually the prior gets washed out. It's just like it's always been from the first example with low tossing. It was like that. Uh, 
really this phenomenon is the same as regression to the mean at the top level, right? So when you run an ordinary OLS regression, uh, you don't make the, the prediction for every case as being exactly the outcome from that case. You want them to shrink towards the population mean, and that's called regression to the mean. And it makes better predictions. It's exactly the same phenomenon, right? It's because each case has some random variation, which is not a property of the actual entity itself, but just of the sampling. And so you make better predictions when you shrink towards the mean. We're doing regression towards the mean at the second level of inference now. Not just at the individual outcomes, but at the tendencies, the average tendencies of each unit in the data as well. But it's, it's the same concept as regression to the mean, which you've been using all along. So it's, it's not far-fetched at all. Uh, the shrinkage is what we see, uh, to, what happens to estimates. The phenomenon is called pooling, uh, pooling of information. So you can say that shrinkage arises from pooling. Uh, pooling is what we want. So here, I like this, sorry, this is uh, uh, one of my favorite posters. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, like, so shrinkage arises from pooling. Each tank informs estimates of other tanks. Um, it, what's being pooled here is information among tanks. It's like the coffee robot moving around among, um, among cafes. It pools information among cafes. Uh, the model doesn't have amnesia as a result of the pooling. It remembers uh, as it moves from uh, uh, cluster to cluster. Um, the pooling is, is I, as I tried to show you in these examples, is influenced by the amount of data in each cluster uh, and the amount of variation among clusters, the sigma that's estimated as well. If the clusters vary a lot, you don't get much pooling. Why? Because the model won't be skeptical of an extreme cluster. It'll be plausible, right? Because basically it means if there's a lot of variation, then nothing's extreme, right? You can be anything at once. Uh, if instead there's very little variation among the clusters, then there'll be a lot more pooling uh, because then the model infers, uh, hopefully correctly, that the variation you've observed is largely a consequence of sampling and not of uh, the long-term, the out-of-sample, the what we call the regular features. Remember regularization? The regular features of the data generating process. Does this make sense? Okay. Uh, all of this, uh, the benefits, arise from uh, everything we learned in Chapter 6, the trade-off between underfitting and overfitting. Uh, we're, we're regularizing here, but we're learning the amount of regularization we need instead of having to guess it or, or get it from scientific principles, which is best way to do it, obviously. Uh, you can learn it from the data if you have a multi-level structure. And that's what's going on here. You're learning the prior so that you can uh, regularize your inferences. You're learning that prior from the data instead. But the benefits, the reason the estimates are better is because they're trading off uh, underfitting and overfitting. It's Ulysses Compass. So when you come back on Friday, um, I will pick up exactly here and I will show you I'll try to connect this tadpole example to the underfitting overfitting trade-off so you understand that. And then we'll do another example where we have even more varying intercepts uh, so that you can see that we can, we can have all kinds of clusters in the same model, as many as you'd like. Because that's normal in experiments, right? You've got all kinds of clusters. Uh, there's experimental block, and there's treatment, and there's a bunch of stuff. And they all happen at the same time in a rich inferential mix. And you want to be able to have them all together. So I'm going to show you an example of that uh, on Friday. Okay, thank you for your indulgence, and stay dry.